Hello everyone, how are you doing today? I hope everyone is doing fine. Welcome subscribers, welcome new subscribers. Thank you for following, liking, sharing, and subscribing to our channel. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you for being here with me today. Uh, I'm finally in my store uh, I finally got my store going here, so I'm in here for the first time doing uh, a video in my new store. So if you're ever in the Arkansas Alexander area, please stop by. I'm still adding more products every day. We got, uh, I, I don't do any online uh, delivery or selling. But if you're ever here, you're welcome to stop by and come in the store. I got my oils, I got my candles, got a few books, some oracle cards, incense. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm still adding stuff. So And I'm going to start doing workshops as well. But that's another story. I'm just really excited. The Ancestors has really been uh, good to me. And I thought I would just share uh, what's been going on. It's been very, very exciting. Uh, but today I wanted to talk, I said I would come back and do a uh, book review on this book, Deliverance. Ah, uh, this is a very good book. It's invaluable. I'm talking about priceless. I'm talking about priceless. You got to have this. This book confirms so much at the same time. Uh, inspired me to take my ancestral veneration to a, another level. You know, it, it confirmed what I was already doing, but it also inspired me to take my uh, ancestral veneration and elevation, especially the elevation part, we're going to talk about that too, uh, to another level. This is going to be a kind of a long book review because I love this book. And there's so much information in here in this book, even though it's not even over 100 pages. I think this book is like 96 pages like the other book. Yeah, it's like 96 pages, just like the other book. Uh, it has maybe four or five chapters in there. Let's see. Let me make sure. One, two, three, four, five. Make five chapters in here. And I mean, it is, is this is a juicy book. It's really good. Uh, I, I think I paid eight bucks for it, eight or nine bucks for it. That's a great price for this book invaluable you got to have this 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 is you know and i'm really a fan of it because i'm really into the african uh american indigenous spiritual practice hoodoo whatever you want to call it i'm really into that and this is a great introduction i wish i would have got this book at first but it's the reason why i'm getting it in this order i guess because the answer it really confirms that the ancestors has really been leading me so, and this book confirmed a lot of stuff, but at the same time, it's inspired me to take my uh, my ancestral work to a, a whole new level, like a higher level. So, this is a really good book and breaking everything down, which we're going to go over it. Uh, I'm very excited to go over it, so let's just get in here. Uh, oh, this is a really good book, and I'm going to read maybe about four or five pages out of here. So, it might be pretty long because this... this um, the author of the book is kind of thorough. And the author of the book is Key Armand. Let me let you see it again. I'm going to leave the other title of the book here, though. So if you're looking for it, I think I got it from Amazon or Thrift, or thrift Books. I don't know where I got this from because I'm always shopping around. I may have got it from Amazon. I'm not sure, you guys. But you could just Google it and all the where it's available will come up. Okay, so let's dive in here. Uh, what I, I had some I want to go. What is hoodoo? What is hoodoo? Hoodoo, also not known as conjure root work, helping yourself, tricking, throwing roots, and a plethora of other terms, is a traditional system of African American folk magic, both popular and infamous throughout the rural South since the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, drawing on American Indian, Northern European, and Jewish Kabbalist, Kabbalistic techniques and tools at various points throughout its evolution. Its roots remain steeped in 
Southern African American folkways and Congo practices of Africa that provide their precursor. As an interconnected range of folk medicine and spiritual re remediation practices developed and preserved by enslaved Africans, their descendants, and some ethnic outsiders, Hoodoo feels a vital role in the social fabric of the Black American communities, where it functions as a primary form of counseling and health care while providing tools for protection and overcoming adversity in an overtly oppressive and di discriminatory discriminatory overculture. By coupling the use of natural herbs, roots, minerals, zoological curros with prayerful intent, traditional folk magic, mythologies, home practitioners, and professional root doctors have responded to the needs and the desires of the families, friends, and clients for hundreds of years. Though couched in a Southern Baptist cosmology, Variations of hoodoo have existed since inception. One branch, ha one branch has Roman Catholic overtones, including invocations of saints. Another holds to veneration of figures recognized in spiritual church move movement, such as the Black Hawk, the, the Native Warrior. So they let you know a, a branch of Catholicism because, see, they call on the saints. They work with the spirits and the ancestors, too. So there's still a form of hoodoo. Hoodoo is really about getting into those ancestors, too. Uh, that's that's like the foundation of African or indigenous or Aboriginal person's roots is working with the ancestors. So hoodoo is kind of steep, you know. It is not kind of it is steep in that because that's where you know your mediumship and your connection with the spirit first start is with your ancestors. So you know, uh, like I said, I like this book. Uh. Recitation and writing of psalms, other biblical scriptures, are popular practices but do not override the fluid nature of improvisatory, spirit-led intercession that characterize conjured black Protestant foundations. Still, hoodoo is not traditionally considered to be a religion, making it incredibly, incredibly adaptable to the spiritual paths of those who find it. You know, like I said, it's always synchronized. That's what I like about this spiritual practice because you can always synchronize it. You know, you can always do more with it. I know I had somebody telling me, and I was following my ancestors. I had somebody telling me that I couldn't work with Lord Ganesh, that uh, Elect Buh didn't tell me to work with Lord uh, Ganesh. And I know it was Elect Buh, you know what I'm saying? But then, you know, people like to tell you about your experience and what's impossible and you got to be initiated and all that. Don't fall for the hype. Don't fall for the hype. Always be led by your intuition. And I was right because, you know, so many things when I started working with Lord Ganesh, a lot of blockages and, you know, obstacles started to be removed. I was finally able to open up my store after all these um, stall. It was a lot of stalling going on because of the weather. So I was actually able to finally open up my store and get it all going. Uh, let me go on. Still hoodoo is not traditionally... Okay. Today, many talented skilled hoodoo root doctors have additional backgrounds in one or more other spiritual traditions and healing modalities found around the world, including Reiki, Wicca, Lakumi, Santeria, Haitian voodoo, to name a few. These workers' multicultural experiences inform their understanding of healing and the world at large, just as the 20th century brought innovations such as the candles, oils from outside the Black American Indian context, so will the electric traditions influence the practice of hoodoo root work for centuries to come. That's what I like. You know, hoodoo too reminds me a lot of shamanism. That's why I'm so into shamanism too. Shamanism, you know, it, it's not really just, they come up with these different terms, but to me, some of these terms don't even define some of the work that we do, you know, some of us that's into this and interested in all this, it's, it's not like one word to really define who we are, or who you are when you go down this path. That's why I said, you know, follow your intuition, be led, be led by your intuition. And that was on page, uh, what page was that? Seven. Now I'm going to page nine, understanding magic. Understanding magic. Diagnosing spiritual problems. In order to perform effective healing remediations of jinxes, cross conditions, and curses, we first need to understand the many routes by which such negative situations can 
can come about and how to distinguish one condition from another so that we may select the most beneficial treatment. I like this book because they go, she goes, this person goes into detail, letting you know what a crossing is, what an uncrossing is, exactly what's the difference in between the two. What is a jinx, what is a curse, and then telling you, giving you direct instructions on how to do it. This is a great reference book. It's a must-have. If you're just getting into hoodoo and, and you want to study something vast as hoodoo, because hoodoo is vast, I recommend it, you know, before you jump into Wicca or anything else like that. This is a great, because you have to first establish your connection with the ancestors or shaman work. Shaman work as well, because it's, this is a lot like that. Um, I recommend this book. This is a great reference book. Should have got a long time ago, but I guess I was I got it when I needed it, you know, and it was a lot of confirmation when I started going through this book. Ma understanding magic. Magic spells that is techniques used to affect change in world in the world through non-ordinary means have been practiced in all cultures since the dawn of time. And as many variations in, in spells exist as do cultures that have ever populated planet Earth. Both spiritual specialists and, and lay persons have equipped themselves with knowledge and tools to help themselves and others. Gestures, chants, incantations, symbols, Mental projections, materials found in nature, invocation of spirits, and more have been used standalone acts of magic and in combination with, with another to ward off harmful influences, attract material abundance, encourage fertility, find lost items, attack foes, and achieve every other need and goal known to man. The belief that a magic spell efficacy can be increased by proper location of timing is nearly universal as well. So some who do practitioners enjoy doing their work by the signs of the phases of the moon or days ruled by particular planets whose influence is in alignment with what they seek to accomplish. Newcomers to magical practice often wonder what the most powerful spell is for a given condition, not realizing that it's generally not that simple. A person's geographic location, ability to harness mental focus, the vulnerability of possible target and many other factors matter terms for achieving favorable outcomes. Spells exist and can be invented for nearly every kind of circumstance, but a basic understanding of magical theory can go a long way toward quenching doubt and anxiety. I believe that every spell, like every mundane word, act, and gesture, a signal sent out into the universe, a magic is most often performed to shift the odds in favor of a goal being achieved or the likelihood of an event happening. It is common for folks to be obvious when a spell they have performed or hired others to perform has taken effect. Rather than being supernatural, magic works by bending the natural world to the will of its wielder, so it, its results are more often than not seemingly coincidental. It's all subtle. It seems coincidental, but it's all done on a subtle level. And it's all done over here. That's why meditation, that's why I love journey work. Meditation, all that is essential, especially when it comes to focusing on your magic. All right. No matter what your personal goals here, a few advisory advisory guidelines for harnessing the energies of magic. These are not specific to hoodoo, but can be found in one form or another in many magical traditions. And then they go through here to uh, list some of the high, uh, some of the signs and how to connect with your craft. So she lists that. Like, he lists that. Very good book. Understanding Spiritual Gifts. Page 13. Page 13, despite the Western world culture's headlong embrace of materiality, skepticism, quite a few people continue to, bo to be born with heightened spiritual sensitivity, spiritual gifts, all indigenous, did you hear that? All indigenous and indigenous derived this for communities recognize such gifts. These terms used here are those found in the black American community to describe the kinds of spiritual giftedness, giftness, that may be bestowed upon certain individuals. Dreaming true. 
Having dreams that give insight into our unknown matters. Having the sight. Able to experience clairvoyance. Having the ability to see spirits discriminate in, dis, and, discarnate, and discarnate entities. Being gifted for the work. Having talent to affect the world through conscious magical effort and subconscious manifestations. All this is consciousness. See, when you get into this, magic is consciousness. That's what it's all about. I keep saying that. I keep saying that you can't have one without the other. So that meditation and that visualization and all that, all that. If you want to figure magic out, you're going to have to get into your psychology. You're going to have to get into your mind and see how your mind works. I keep saying that. Though innumerable books have been written about cultivating intuition, increasing skills and mediumship, gaining spiritual power, little to nothing has been written about merely accepting spiritual gifts. Occasionally when clients come to root doctors to emerilate, I may be pronouncing that wrong, you guys. You know, I, I'm not the best at that. Cross conditions, the messages from their spirits have more to do with the need for them to honor and claim their own giftedness for the work than the curses, than with curses. Mention, mention of these gifts by the conjure doctor is often met with meek affirmation by the client, but the affirmation may be couched couched in fear and backed by memories of confusing childhood experience in the spirit realm, followed by ne negation on the part of, of parents who did not know what to make of their child's experiences. So you can have this gift, uh, and I saw that too, kind of with my ancestors. It's a lot of them that had the gift, like my grandfather, he had the gift, he could see, he had a veil, he could see spirits, but he never did work with it, you know, uh, it's several more. I had an uncle that that did some work like that, but they did. They never continued with it, especially when it came to honoring the ancestors. So I kind of feel like the ancestors was leading us down that path, but it was we wasn't sticking on it. Nobody in the family was really sticking on it. Uh, I digress. I'm sorry. I had to put my own experience because I love this book, so I relate a lot to it. Denial of your spirit gifts as with self-denial in all its forms is far more dangerous than what you imagine acceptance of them will bring. See, I, that's why I, I feel like that's why that karmic little... I'm, let me be quiet because, ooh, honey, I'm about to preach over here. You may not know to use these gifts that you have incarnated with, but trying to shut them off or ignore them to a kin to trying to run a while, uh, run a while sign off your leg. You know, you're just cutting yourself off like that. Spiritual gifts are an initiative to our being, and I've provided many with divinatory messages in which the remediating action toward getting a grip on life and gaining mastery, power, clarity, and sanity were fully, were fully accept their spiritual power and to immediately pray for channels to put it to good use. As a kind mentor once told me at a time, when I did not understand the connection between my anger and my, my energy and my experience of chronic cross conditions at the time, you need to take responsibility for the powers you brought into this into this life. So, oh, and I can relate a lot to this. I can relate a lot to this. Oh, my gosh. So, my, I love this book. Really good book. Now, uh, uh, Understanding Initiatory Crisis. I don't know if I ever talked about this before, but when you're called to do a certain type of spirit work or a shaman, you go through an initiatory crisis. And sometimes this can be mentally, this can be physically, you know, you could be a person that went through some trauma and then trying to heal through that crisis because now it's affecting you. Initiatory crisis is, is something else, but you're also being initiated into these spiritual gifts, you're walking into the accepting these spiritual gifts if you ever experience something like this. I think it varies and everybody have their own definition of a initiatory crisis, but I'm going to dive in here. And you can do more research into initiatory crisis because everybody has a different experience. That's why the shaman or a true healer is, you know, is usually called the wounded healer because they have experience in pain, in wounds. So there are better healers once they have learned to heal themselves. They can heal others, you know, with with no problems because they have healed themselves. But let me go on. Understanding initiatory crisis. Many years ago, I received a call from Christian woman in South 
in the South who wanted to know if her son had a curse placed on him by his girlfriend as he was bedridden in a hospital and doctors could not figure out what was wrong with him. The girlfriend sat by his bedside holding his hand through the ordeal, but the, but the only option left was to turn over every rock that meant turning to a practitioner in the spiritual arts. My reading confirmed the allegiance of her son's girlfriend to him and that no curse had been placed. Been placed. Excuse me. But other things were revealed as well, including the fact this wasn't the first time that he found himself in a hospital without a due medical cause. Most evident was that this was the work of something divine, that there was a spiritual calling in this man's life that he had chosen to ignore time and time again. I need... I, I never seen anything like it before, but when I asked the client if she understood what I was saying within the context of her 30-year-old son's life experiences, she responded affirmatively. There was a lifestyle that he'd been needing to put behind him, friends and enablers that he'd been warned he had to let go of. He had refused, and now time was running short. Ultimately, the solution was a tea of eyebrows for wiping her son's eyelids brow to help induce clarity as well as the bedside visit from a pastor of her church whom she trusted would understand the calling of her son's life and encourage him to commit to involvement in community under someone's guidance and mentorship. Within a few years, it would be me who was experiencing spirit-led circumstances outside of what I was considered to be humanly possible, urging me toward new ways of being divinely mandated responsibilities and responsibilities. Across the world since time in, more, in memorial serving individuals have experienced a holy terror under the guidance of spirit. In Rituals of Resistance, Jason R. Young writes, the Con Congolese, Congolese, I'm sorry, Congolese often regarded illness as a spiritual sum in such that a person afflicted with a particular disease might be initiated as a priest, specially suited to address that very sickness, varying as widely in like likeness duration as do types of cultures that exist come the common thread connecting these ungrounding experiences is that they are in actuality a homecoming for us to truly come home. However, we'll need to strip away that which is false and be granted new bodies and new visions. Spiritual callers and initiatory crisis can be scary and can seem manifest as sudden state of cross conditions and cannot be remedied via spiritual cleansing or protection. Though divination by trusted worker is of utmost importance in discerning what is actually going on, the person in crisis, friends or family members may notice signs like these. Spiritual visitations, sudden visions, spontaneous possessions by spiritual entities, sudden physical illness without a, a cause, sudden mental health crisis, loss of sanity without no known cause, sudden injury resulting in intensified spiritual awareness. Okay. It is likely that the person who experiences spiritual calling or crisis has had signs of alluding to a spiritual destiny earlier in life. Like the client's son mentioned earlier, earlier, or has involved in cultivation of spiritual gifts as an adult, these are helpful to consider when attempting to discern it as to whether a spirit-led initiatory experience is actually taking place. If you are someone who has found yourself in the midst of what you believe might be a spirit-led initiation or a spiritual crisis, that's why I said you. There is no need for initiation. Sometimes, because when the spirit calls you, the spirit calls you. You know, you might have your spiritual awakening at any time. That's why I understand this initiation stuff. Your your enlightenment is your spiritual initiation. When you choose to lift the veil from your eyes and do do the necessary work, you are initiating yourself into the spiritual realm. You becoming aware of that. Okay, that was really good. Uh, like I said, this is going to be a long one. I'm so sorry, you guys. And I, I haven't even, you know, it's so much stuff in this book. 
you know, it's so much stuff in this book. So this is going to be a long book review. I'm so sorry. But I, I I felt like this stuff was worth mentioning because, like I said, this this is a really good book on healing, on crossing yourself and ancestors work, too. If you're into ancestors work, this is a good book for that as well. OK, let me go on. Understanding Jason's cross conditions. One of the primary goals of hoodoo magical practice is to move through life free from hindrance to good health, financial security, peace of mind, emotional fulfillment, and general success. To find oneself thwarted in any of these arenas is to be jinxed or under cross conditions. The term jinx usually refers to your luck having been crossed up. If you were once a winner at bingo, the numbers no longer come out for you. If you had a gift for finding parking spaces, it has deserted you. Things break and can't be fixed. When you phone people, you either get a busy signal or or you are put on hold. Most of all, you just can't win. If a jinx persists to point that your life is seriously messed up, you are said to be under cross conditions. Invisible barriers block your, block your path. Roads that once were open are closed. You lose your job, you, your car breaks down, and your health suff suffers. The household may be affected. Cross conditions are not curses per se, but an enemy can curse you to suffer cross conditions. See, that's why I said that people are talking bad about you. You know what I'm saying? You got the boys. Sometimes you do have to put go ahead and do some work on somebody because they just they won't shut up and they don't realize the power of their words. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, some people you have to work them. You have to work on them. Uh, let me go home. <laughs> And even if a curse is not the cause, you would certainly want to be uncrossed and free from jinxes. Other factors that can cause cross, condition, cross conditions range from demonic possession to intrusions by spirits of the dead upon one's person or own. Negative entities may have been directed to afflict you through a curse, or they may be wandering spirits who are paratizing a human victim. Most easily preventable are the cross conditions that grow out of the daily stresses, emotional wounds, mental anxieties that have been left to fester unresolved. We shower and brush our teeth regularly because we know that neglecting our physical hygiene will result in deterioration of our health. But neglecting our emotional and mental spiritual needs leads to, an, to our ruin as well. There is something to be said for understanding the cross conditions, especially in severe manifestation have potential to be initiatory. Did you hear that? Mm -mm -mm. And like I said, this book was so much confirmation on what I got going on with me. I'm telling you, this is not the type of initiation that the priest or priestess is a religious tradition leads to adhere through. But the type that life itself is always presenting us, a time of financial destitution, discovery of lover's betrayal, or finding oneself the target of spiritual attack are all opportunities for us to see that we are made of to gather our resources and put them to use towards self-preservation and personal growth. A near breakdown might mean that you are ripe for a real breakthrough. Even the evil deeds committed by others against you might lead you to discover the path of your highest calling. Ah, good book, good book. Okay, I think we're going to go over I think I got, I think, is this the last one? Oh, no. I got one more, two more pages. We got two more pages, and then I'm going to close out. I won't keep you any further. Uncrossing and spiritual cleansing. These are two different things. I didn't know that. Uh, and this this Arthur really breaks this down. This is on page 29. Like I said, this book is packed with information. You have to have this book. I mean, gosh, you have to have this book. This book is good. Uncrossing is undertaken to remove energies, jinxes, curses, spirit intrusions, and self-imposed obstacles. Acts of uncrossing and spiritual cleansing are also performed at regular intervals by many practitioners as a form of energetic maintenance of self and of home. See, that's what the ancestors told me to do when I did the uncrossing on me. I already know that I have to do that at least once a month. That's my that's my self care. That's my spiritual regimen. You know, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's that's what I've been told to do. You know, intuitively, 
You know, after I heard all that, I, I just intuitively knew, hey, I need to do this. Methods of encrossing vary, but a good first step is to perform a divination to reveal who laid the trick that crossed you up. It may have come from far or near. The sender may be known or unknown. Divination should reveal both how the crossing came about and how to best remedy it. Crossing spells can be worked at distance with candles, dolls, photographs, but often known enemy is near. As Jim Haskins noted in Voodoo and Hoodoo, since the principle of light to light is so commonly used, the source of the hurt often gives a clue to the placement of the hurting object. Thus, headaches may be caused by something hidden in the pillow under the head of the bed, impotence by something under the sheet or around the bed. In such cases, removal of the offending object is, is the priority. After divination cleansing is undertaken, this will vary based on your situation. For instance, Chinese wash is an excellent product for cleansing, cleaning rooms, and you can bathe with it as well. But if a foe has sprinkled bad luck powder for you to step in, a foot wash with Vin Vin, fear not, walk over evil, and blessing bath crystals might be more effective. Likewise, if your primary symptoms is an inability to find a job, you might try uncrossing bath followed by blockbuster, road opener, and crown of success work. The duration of uncrossing treatments to variable is variable. A person who is diligently sending in applications but still has trouble landing a position may find resolution after three baths with Van Van products. But if severe magical attack has been detected, baths may need to be undertaken a day, daily for 21 days. You may do the work yourself, but if divination indicates that you are beyond the help of do-it-yourself baths, you, you can hire a root doctor. Some readers suggest that clients find local workers for aid with hands on baths and house cleaning, but others operate at distance by performing proxy work for clients. An authentic, authentic distant practitioner should send you baths and other supplies by mail, which instructions for use, or at least supply a shopping list of what you will need to get. This is called backing up the work. A good root doctor will also not be upset if you consult another diviner for occasional diagnostic re check reading to see how things are going. So they're giving you a spiritual regimen right there. Like I said, it's a really good book. This is the last one, and I'm going to let you lovelies go. Uh, this one's actually two pages, and I'm going to let you go. This is developing a relationship with the ancestors. This is my favorite one. Very detailed. Uh, love this. I love this part of this. Excuse me. I love this part of this book. So let me dive in. Deve developing relationship with ancestors. Today, many urban people are cut off from the practices from the practices their own ancestors maintained to forge connection to their forebears. But in the United States, the 19th century spiritualist church and the 20th century spiritual church movement founded by Mother Leafy Anderson of Wisconsin reinvigorated African styles of ancestor veneration in the dysphoria. Simultaneously, the work of Alan Kardec, founder of Spiritism in the 19th century France, provided a new spiritual methodology for works of mediumship that rapidly spread throughout the Latin American and Caribbean under the name Esperismo. Uh, Espir the techniques Cardiff espoused helped to fill the gaps in the ancestral rivers for African peoples who'd been physically displaced from the lands in which their dead were buried forming a tradition that grew into a parallel alongside such religions as Lakumi or Santeria in Cuba. So ancestor, you know, like I say, is the foundation of everything. I don't care what you get in to or before you get into anything. Develop this relationship with your ancestors because that's your first area of defense. Learn more about you, whether you need to elevate ancestors. That's important too because a lot of us don't have really good ancestors, and that's where the elevation comes into place. You may be the only one who does that. You know, you may be called to do that. That's, that's, that is your gift, to be able to work with the ancestors, to elevate them. So you may be the only one 
called to do it. Sometimes that may be the case. How to build an ancestor altar. It tells you about that. Placement of the ancestor altar in the home. All right, tending to the ancestor altar, medianship at the ancestor altar. Maybe I'm going to read that one. I'm going to read that mediumship because I thought that that's, that is what's really, maybe I've been doing it because I have like this great meditation video. So I think I've been probably doing it unconsciously in shaman work, but I do be bringing messages out. I bought a message out last night, which this book confirmed the message that I got in my journey, my shamanic journey to the ancestors. But I really want to beef that up. I feel like I can do a little bit more work into spirit, working with spirit more. So I want to kind of beef that up. I thought this was interesting. Many people consider their ancestors and personal spirit guides to be their primary source of gaining wisdom and cl clarity as well as their first line of defense against the tag. If you seek if you seek to hone your mediumship abilities, then time spent at your ancestor altar can be great help as well. After giving offerings and expressing gratitude, pray sincerely from your heart for God is wisdom and clarity. Then sit in silence before the altar for at least fifteen minutes and afterwards record your impressions. These may be images, thoughts, words that came to mind during the meditation. That's what happened. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. Performing this activity at least once a week can have tremendous effect on your intuitive abilities, the grace with which you move through life. If you don't experience anything, continue anyway. The dead may make their message known in dreams or in everyday signs and omens. Many psychic readers attribute intuitive insight to the aid of ancestors, and many root doctors believe their help is integral in the potency of their work. So I know I go to my ancestor Oster at least once a week and light candles, give water, liquor, all of that good stuff. So, and that makes a difference. I pray uh, to them. So this book kind of confirmed a lot of things that I was already doing. I do, I usually do a, a shamanic meditation once a week when I do go to my altar. And I got some messages last week and it confirmed it. But this, this book also confirmed, you know, okay, I'm on the right track. I'm doing the right thing. So the ancestors is really leading me, leading me where I, where I should be, you know. And maybe I was meant to get this book at this time just to confirm what I'm, I'm doing. Like I said, th this is a really good book. You have to get this book. How to perform an ancestral elevation. This is my favorite part of this book. This is my favorite part. And those of you that don't have, you know, kind of good ancestors and you need to do some elevation, I promise you'll see a difference in working with your ancestors once you start doing this elevation work, you know. And it doesn't take a lot. Just be consistent at it, you know, once a week. Start doing it. Especially if you got like generations of messed up DNA, this is going to help. Ancestral elevation is a nine-day spirit spiritist rite performed to help spirits of the dead progress in their evolution through intercession and words of comfort and relief. This work can help transport the departed from the physical plane to the ancestral realm or from a non-physical plane to an even higher realm which can benefit the living as well. Ancestral elevation can be performed for one or more specific ancestors or for all of one's ancestors who need it and even for spirits of the dead who are not biologically related to the practitioner. It is a truly malleable rite whose components can be altered according to the tastes and the tradition important to the spirits of the dead who as being elevated such as the inclusion of prayers from the religions they practice when alive. For this work, you would need a white white altar cloth, one large or one nine small candles. You can get a, one of those large nine. I usually use a large uh, white candle, but you can get nine small white candles if you want to. Uh, did I lose my place here? Okay, white candles. Eight sturdy books 
or bricks in a glass of clean water. Pleasant smelling incense is a nice addition. Commercial self-lighting condition incenses such as blessing, healing, spirit guide are good. Alternative, you can burn resin and herbs like frankincense, myrrh, athea root chips on a self-lighting charcoal dip. If Native Americans are among the ancestors, tobacco, sweet grass, and Indian spirit guide incense may be used as well. You may dress your white candle with some more oil, with one or more oils that speak to the energies of blessing, healing, peace, love, and uncrossing. First, create an altar by spreading the white cloth on a clean surface with the glass of water at the center top of the cloth. You may add white flowers to the altar or religious items that would com be comforting to the souls of the dead you are elevating. For example, draping a rosary over the glass of water for the souls of the Catholic, uh, who were Catholic while alive. If the rite is being performed for photos of the deceased are available, you may include them on the altar while ensuring that no photos of the living are present. So I'm sure if you got an ancestor altar, you already know that. Don't put the living and the dead on the altar together. That, that confuses the dead. Place a white candle on the altar and light it along with your incense, burning it both as an offering to any Bolivian spirits who arrive to offer aid and as comfort to the souls of the dead whom you are, are elevating. You may find the following words to be inspiration. And these are some words they give. I call upon your um, my ancestral help and spirits, those who live well, died well, made, who died well, made it through the veil and chose to accompany me in this lifetime. I call out to you who bring all that is beautiful, true, ju just into my life. Be here now to protect me and to aid me in the elevation of these souls this day or night. And it gives you that. You may now choose to call out any other helpful spirits with whom you have strong relationship as well as Bolivian spirits who wish to wish to aid in providing comfort and elevation to the souls you are assisting. Feel their presence around you. The more passionate energy you put into these words, the better emit the energies of love, remembrance towards the souls you are elevating. Each word is an offering. You may feel inspired to improvise or make gestures for examples, raising your hands to symbolize elevation. Preferably ask for your guiding spirits to aid in helping these souls let go of, of what is holding them back. At this time, you may offer up traditional prayers or songs that would be comforting to the ancestors. You are elevated. Perhaps scriptures, uh, Psalms 23, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Imagine your voice as a sound of bridge connecting these souls from the plane they are on, the plane it would be best served them to go, to go, to get to. And it gives you some prayers to say. Then thank your helping spirits for their protection and aid in elevating the souls you are assisting and snuff out your candle. The next day, dismantle the altar and place a second book or brick on the clean surface and drape the white cloth over it. Resemble your altar on top of, of this with a glass of fresh clean water. Perform the service again each day, adding a book or brick to the stack, reassembling the altar set up on top of it. At the end of the nine days, you you may choose the divination or the effects of your work. I don't know, I've never did that. I wonder, can you have to do it that way? You know, everybody adapt their work to uh, differently. But like I said, this is a really good book. I encourage you to get it. I'm sorry, the book report, you know, this book review was so long, but I love this book. And I thought these chapters, you know, was worth going over. The name of the book is Deliverance, Who Do Spells, Uncrossing, Healing and Protection. Got to have great reverence book, great information. Thank you for being here with me today. Light and love. May the ancestors be with you.